Hi friends, Catherine here, and today I have a very special guest. Uh, I'm here with my friend Ron Sellers. I've known Ron in the market research industry for many years. And Ron is somebody who has a great deal of experience both in quantitative and qualitative research. And, um, and he's also the president of Gray Matter Research. Uh, so I'll be providing his contact information at the end. Um, one of the things that is really interesting is that Ron has been doing a great service to us in survey research. Uh, since 2008, he's been doing deep dives into um, panel quality. And as research rockstar students know, especially those of you who have taken our sampling practicum, uh, we all know that there are some challenges with online panel. Yet we all love online panel too, for various reasons. Um, so Ron, I know that you've got some really fresh, hot off the presses research about challenges with online panels. Um, so I would like to invite you to give us a little bit of an overview on your most recent dive into online panel quality. Absolutely, Catherine. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2008. And uh, this is the third report in the series and we, for consistency, uh, the first one was Dirty Little Secrets of Online Panels. And then the second one was More Dirty Little Secrets of Online Panels. And this one is still More Dirty Little Secrets of Online Panels. And this one, I have categorized it to colleagues as the most important thing that I've done in the insights industry. Uh, because, as you mentioned, we all love panel, we all use panel, we all know there are problems with panel. But it's sort of this nebulous, yeah, there are problems, but nobody can really say how big the problems are, what effect it has on the data, what, is it affecting my studies, things like that. And so I decided it was time to, to quantify this. So we fielded a, uh, about a 10, 12 minute questionnaire, so nothing overly taxing with a couple of thousand people and we just we picked uh, five of the 10 largest online panels out there uh, so this is a blended approach which is particularly common in the industry today and one of the things and we partnered with this uh, on this with Harmon research who does a, a lot of field work they do tens of thousands of online panel interviews every month and in talking with Harmon Research, uh, one of the things that I asked them is, okay, in your experience with all of your different clients, how many people are taking various steps to assure panel quality? And I'll just give you four uh, examples of what they told me. And, and I talked with another field agency that does a lot of this work as well. And the numbers they gave me were really, really similar. So these are two of the largest field centers uh, so in Harmon's estimation, 25% don't evaluate open-ended questions for anything other than just pure gibberish. So in other words, if somebody types in KJ, 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 you know, just slaps something through the keyboard and moves on, then they get tossed out of the survey. But if somebody just types in, I like it, or good, or something like that, they stay in the question. They stay in the data for 75% of the researchers out there. 50% uh, don't eliminate straight liners. So if they have a grid question and they somebody does strongly agree or strongly dislike or whatever to every single one, that doesn't call anything into question. They just stay in the data. 95% don't include fake brands in awareness questions. 95%. 95% don't evaluate numerical open ends. And by numerical open end, I mean how much, did you, how much would you estimate you spent on clothing last year? Or how much would you say you gave to nonprofit organizations last year? And so if it's a small number, you know, people might say, oh, $20, $25. When you get up into larger numbers, the, the normal thing is to estimate. I mean, do you really know that you spent $697 on nonprofits last year? No, you say, eh, I guess about $700. I guess about $1,000. I guess about $200. When you get an answer like one, two, three, four, five, or 2222, two, 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 it's not a guarantee that something is going on, but it's a really strong indicator. 95% of researchers are not evaluating numerical open ends for problems in the data. Okay, so our estimate, and there are lots of other steps that you can take, but our estimate is that 90 to 95% of researchers are not doing enough to, to discriminate between good quality respondents and poor quality respondents. And so that's one of the things we wanted to look at. We also wanted to look at 
uh, how many really poor quality respondents are there out there? Now, this is a relatively subjective measurement. And we kind of divided people into two categories. One was the problem was so egregious that it was obvious that they didn't care. They were, or they were a bot. You know, somebody who would, in an open-ended question, copy the question itself and paste it into the response box. And, and we see stuff like that. Or people who would, would write in just bizarre, almost like LSD trips, just stream of consciousness, <laughs> wacko kind of stuff. These are people who are obviously don't care, not paying attention, maybe not even real people. So we, we pulled them from the data. People make mistakes. So we actually, uh, you know, they will misread a question. They will, they will mean to type in uh, 20 and they will type in 222 two, two because the key sticks. I mean, lots of things like that can happen. So we looked at people who had four or more significant errors, significant problems, and said, you know, if they've got one or two, we can, we can assume it was, you know, they were, they were distracted on a question. Four or more, there's a, there's a real problem with this respondent. And between those really egregious problems and the four or more errors, we tossed out 46% of the online panel respondents. And it was not even a particularly difficult or lengthy questionnaire. So what we find is that 46% of the people you're getting in a typical online survey are complete trash responses. They're not valid for anything. And so, you know, some people say, okay, well, Maybe they weren't paying a lot of attention. Maybe they made some mistakes, but how bad are they? And let me just give you, we divided them into valid respondents and bogus respondents. And I'll just give you five quick measurements that, that demonstrate how big, how big the difference is. So uh, M&T Bank is a, is a financial services organization up in New York and, and the, the, the East Coast area in about seven states. And we asked people brand awareness for a variety of different financial institutions. Nationally, among our valid respondents, brand awareness for, or sorry, brand familiarity for MNC Bank was 11%, which is not unexpected given the fact they're only in seven of our 50 states. Among the bogus respondents, it was 35%. So triple, more than triple, okay? People who claim to use TikTok monthly or more, and this was before the, the current controversy. Valid respondents, 8%. Bogus respondents, 23%. So again, almost triple. The, the responses. Brand Awareness for Charity Navigator. Now, this is, a, this is a watchdog organization that rates nonprofit organizations. It's a fairly niche brand. So it's not like you know, General Motors or something like that. Among our valid respondents, 15% brand awareness. Among our bogus respondents, 58%. Massive, massive difference. We ask people to estimate their monthly spend on medical. Among our valid respondents, the average was $568. Among our bogus respondents, it was over 9,000. People were writing in ridiculous numbers. And then the proportion on a social issue, the proportion who feel the United States should have no limits whatsoever on immigration. Among our valid respondents, 28%. Among our bogus respondents, 62%. So we're getting, I mean, we have, we have really strong evidence that not only are 40 to 50% of online respondents complete garbage. But we now have, on a variety of different measures, evidence of exactly what it's doing to your data if these people are not cleaned out, if they are not found and gotten rid of. And so, I mean, this, this has a massive, massive impact. Um, we, we put in, a, I mentioned putting in fake brands and awareness questions. Mm -hmm. we, we did a string of uh, financial services with Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Huntington Regions, et cetera. And we also put in two that weren't close to anything else that, that really exists. Generosity Bank and Livewire Bank just came up with those on our own. And among the valid respondents, 3% claim to be, to have some familiarity somewhat or, or very familiar with, with one or both of those brands. Again, proving that even with valid respondents, there are people who make mistakes, they, they're not paying attention. I mean, it, it does happen, but 3%, right? Among the bogus respondents, 37%. So, I mean, and just to, to demonstrate how bogus these are, we had three regional financial institutions, Huntington, Regions, and M&T Bank. 
and these are in specific states. And with the, uh, the brand uh, familiarity for these different brands, among the people who were valid respondents, we had an average of 62%, I'm sorry, 23%, 23% who claimed brand familiarity with one of these brands who lived outside of their trade area, outside of one of those states. Now you think, well, why would people outside of regions, trade area, service area, be familiar with regions? Well, they may be in an adjacent state, they may travel to that area for business, they may have somebody who, in their family or friends who works there, they, they, maybe they used to live in one of those areas, et cetera. So I think it's, it's fairly reasonable to say that maybe one out of four people um, who are familiar, who claim to be familiar with regions, they don't live in one of the states they serve. But among the bogus respondents, it was on average 62% were outside of their trade area. So among our bogus respondents, it was actually more common to be familiar, familiar with one of these banks when they don't live in the area than it was to be familiar when they do live in the area, which really demonstrates these are, these are completely fraudulent, disengaged, or possibly not even human. They're bots. So what we found in here, and there's lots of other measurements that deals with nonprofit organizations, deals with wireless service providers, a variety of other sectors, uh, social issues, but there, there's a huge problem with online panel sample and 90 to 95% of researchers are not doing enough to clean this out. They're not doing enough to identify these people and get rid of them. And so I'm not saying I'm not a panel hater I'm not somebody who says, oh, you, this is why you only do qualitative, or this is why you only do phone surveys, or, you know, or whatever. Um, but because every methodology has its problems, right? Every methodology has its uses and its downsides. This is one of the downsides of panel. There's a tremendous amount of fraud. So we can use panel, but only if we are diligent to identify and eliminate these people. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, first of all, it's really interesting how the bogus respondents or bots, whatever they are, um, are always high, right? They're always over the, what, the, what the valid respondents are in terms mm -hmm. of their brand awareness or their dollar spending or whatever, So, um, which is really interesting to me. Um, so would a recommendation then be to say, if you are seeing uh, in a survey project that you are getting brand awareness that's much higher than you expected or satisfaction that's much higher than you expected. This may actually, while it might be good news, it's also a red flag. If it's really much higher than expected, you really want to take an extra good look at those records to see if indeed it might be getting inflated by bogus participants. Well, we not only found that bogus respondents were more likely to be familiar, more likely to use different things like that, and some of that is because they don't know what is going to qualify them for the questionnaire. So if we're looking for somebody who's familiar with regions as a financial institution, they want to make sure they qualify and they're not wasting their time, right? So they're going to put that they're familiar. And so that's part of it. But we also saw um, a, a, a greater homogeneity among our bogus respondents. And I'll give you an example. We asked people, uh, a variety of different kinds of organizations, whether they tend to think of those as charitable or nonprofit organizations, right? Because like among our valid respondents, I think it was 90% said, yes, I, an animal rescue shelter or a homeless shelter, I, I automatically think of those as charitable organizations. But a private religious school, I mean, I know it's a religious or a, a nonprofit, but I don't think of it in a category, right? Mm -hmm. So with the different kinds of organizations, we had between 10% and 90%. We had a wide range of what people think of and don't think of. With the bogus respondents that shrank, 31% on one side and 72% on the other. Because a lot of the bogus respondents are just going down and going, yes, 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 move on. Or no, 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 move on. Or they're randomly selecting a couple and just click and moving on, which when they're randomly selecting like that, what would normally score low is more likely to score high. What would normally score high is more likely to score low. So it's the behavior that is not just, it's not just taking things higher, 
but it's getting more homogeneity with the, with the financial institutions, with the valid respondents. You know, we saw the, the smaller regional, like we did a, a bank that only exists in Hawaii. And that was, I think, 4% among the US population that said they had heard of that bank. And then we had Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Citibank, et cetera. There were massive from brand awareness. Whereas with those people either randomly chose or they chose all of them or didn't choose any of them, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the, it's really hard to predict. Once you see the patterns, you start saying, ah, that's why. But before you see the patterns, it's really hard to predict. That's one of the reasons why one of big key takeaways out of this report is you cannot just look at the resulting data from your survey and clean it afterwards. You must, must, must have a strategy beforehand of how you're going to identify and eliminate bogus respondents. Because I mentioned straight lining. Well, you know, that's not too useful if you don't have any great questions. You know, I, I mentioned having this, I didn't mention, but one of the things we looked at is having a screen timer. If all of your questions are real quick, yes, no, like, dislike, you know, what's the difference between somebody who spends five seconds and six seconds? It's going to take that long just to look at the questionnaire and click. Whereas if you have a lengthy concept statement or a, a, a magazine ad they're supposed to read or a bill or they're supposed to look paying attention. So it really depends on the content of the questionnaire. And that's why I'm not a big fan of automation for doing these things, coming up with automated processes, because every questionnaire and every study and every population requires a different approach. And if you use an automated process, you're going to boilerplate that across all the different approaches. Whereas, you know, there's some, there's some clients that say, I do not want any open ends in my, in my questionnaire. I think that's a massive mistake. Open ends are phenomenal for finding bad quality respondents. If the client insists, you're probably not going to put it in, right? So you can't use that as a way of, of finding poor quality respondents. So it, the, the big thing is you've got to have a strategy in place because it's part of the questionnaire design and it's part of the survey programming if you want to effectively find these people. And then you do it before, you do it during, and you do it after. It's not a one-step process. And yep. we actually, at Gray Matter, every online study we do, we go line by line, respondent by respondent through the data, looking for bogus and problematic people. Because if, if it's just an automated process, you, you're just not going to find them. Got it. No, thank you for sharing that. And I, I really like your point about needing to build in, into your process before during and after data collection so that you've got multiple checkpoints through there. Um, I'm wondering in your analysis whether or not you looked at um, the propensity to have bogus respondents by demographic buckets. Uh, for example, in survey research, we all know that young men are particularly difficult uh, to have as research. You know, it's very hard to get young men to answer surveys. Um, right. It's a lot easier to get all women to answer surveys, but young men is typically a, a very difficult demographic to reach. Do you, did you have an opportunity to look at whether or not we see more bogus respondents in specific hard to find demographics? Absolutely. And before somebody accuses me of being ageist or sexist or racist, um, recognize that I have no idea who these people actually are. We can only go by who they claim to be in their profiles. And you mentioned it, uh, there are three kinds of folks that uh, the panel uh, has more difficulty getting to participate. Males, minorities, and younger people. So imagine that the highest propensity for cheating for being a bogus respondent was among males, 52% uh, versus 35% of females. It was very heavily minority. 58% of our minority respondents were bogus compared to 39% of our non-Hispanic whites. And it was massive differences by age. And as the age goes up, the, the, the bogus proportion goes down. It's 16% it's are bogus among the 65 plus population. That goes up until it reaches 62% among people under 35. 
Wow. There's no difference between those under are 25 to 35 and under 25. So think about this. If you're doing a survey of people who are, uh, uh, if you're doing a survey of young black men, chances are a lot of those aren't even young black men. They're people who are filling out that profile because they have learned that's going to get them more surveys. Very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's really relevant. And I know, um, and I, I believe your experiment, this was consumer research. Um, I know in consumer. the past, in the past when I've done a lot of um, B2B research, we had lots of issues with respondent quality specifically in B2B. So I think a lot of our students who do B2B, they're already like on high alert because they know uh, that there can be panel quality issues. Um, and for our students who do a lot of consumer research, um, obviously being sensitive to the fact that if you're trying to fill difficult quota buckets, um, that you have to be extra vigilant on checking those records is a great tip. Um, you also mentioned, you know, that there, um, the issue of, you know, different sectors, different product categories, you know, doing research on nonprofit topics is different than doing research on financial services is doing research different, you know, on research on CPG stuff. Um, so um, obviously, um, you know, as our students are in different are in different sectors, would you have any suggestions about how they need to cater their quality assurance steps based on what industry they're in? It's less related to an industry and more related to the content of the questionnaire. Um, you know, one of the one of the challenges, for instance, of the, uh, the some of the movement to do real quick questionnaires mm -hmm. for a better respondent uh, experience is in a three or four or five minute questionnaire. There's a lot less opportunity to put in some of these quality controls and quality traps. An open end will, people in, in tiny questionnaires will generally figure that's about a minute to have one open end. So if you're trying to do a five minute survey, that's going to take up 20% of your content just to have one question to measure quality. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges when it's, when it's more the agile approach, when it's the, the, the quick research, uh, quick questionnaires, it's a lot harder to measure. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do, if you're not doing brand awareness or brand familiarity measures, then um, it, it really doesn't, you can't put in fake brands, right? And one thing we did find, because we, we tried two different things. We tried fake brands with familiarity and awareness, and we tried fake brands with usage. With usage, the fake brands were, were almost never chosen. Because if somebody's actually reading the question, even glancing at the question, and you've got a list of wireless providers, it, it really doesn't cost them anything more to say, yeah, I use T-Mobile when they actually use T-Mobile, right? It's not going to take them more time. It's a quick glance. It's not going to qualify. They don't know what's going to qualify them, if anything. So they're going to be more likely to be truthful on that rather than just clicking something random. When it's opinion or familiarity, you know, we're asking, you've got to click an answer for all eight brands. Now it's going to take them more time to read these and to click on it. So it's like, okay, top two and I'm done. So it's things like that, that over the years we've, we've become more familiar with. Same thing we learned that red herring questions, you know, please click the box all the way to the right. Please click agree strongly. Those did almost nothing to toss out bogus respondents. Number one, bots, are, those questions are, are, even though only about 25% of researchers use them, those questions are still common enough in questionnaires that bots often recognize those and can respond appropriately. So they don't catch bots. And again, if somebody's even barely glancing at it, they'll see that because it looked different from everybody else, and they'll go, oops, got to click all the way to the right or I'm going to get tossed out, right? right. So they, they really don't catch a lot of people. Now, in terms of what does catch a lot of people and the best ways, there's where you need to work with gray matter research because that's the proprietary, that's the fun part. That's the proprietary information that I can't spill all the beans, right? So. But I take it it has to do with how you are uh, structuring your questions or your scale choices. It's something about the, the content of the questionnaire itself. It, it is the content of the questionnaire. And okay. Every, and, and again, this is why I'm not big on algorithms and things like that for 
uh, panel quality control because every questionnaire is so different. The population is different. Um, it, it's, it's, it really requires a custom thought process. And even though this is uh, one other little quick thing, even though this is not in the report, I think a lot of people tend to think, oh, you use panel, they're disinterested, they're disengaged. When we do a customer survey, we don't have to worry about things like that, right? Yeah, you do. We actually had, uh, uh, we just finished a study for a major nonprofit organization where we were testing a new concept. And I, I went ahead and thought, you know what? These aren't disengaged people, they're their own donors. But let's put a screen timer on this 150 word concept statement anyways, just to see what the data looks like. We ended up tossing out, we didn't toss them from the survey because they were giving reasonable answers to everything else, but they got to this lengthy paragraph they were supposed to read and kind of went, and about 10% of them went, uh, yeah, no, clicked right through it. So at least from the answers of how likely would you be to consider supporting something like this? How interested are you in this? They got tossed out of that. But and wait, I, I thought you said that it was their own donors and not an online panel. It was their own donors. It was their uh, okay. own donors because people were willing to say, you know what? I'll give them 10 minutes for a survey. It's pretty easy. It's, you know, we're clicking along. It's not a problem. Now, all of a sudden, I've got this 150 word paragraph I've got to read. Next. So all they right. were willing to give their time to a point. Everything else was fine. They were willing to give their time to a point. Customers who may not be as engaged with the brand as a donor would be, my guess is, and I want to test this, but my guess is that would probably be an even higher proportion who would see something, whether it's a lengthy grid question or a lengthy description. And so far, they've been really good at giving you answers. But on the grid question, it's like, yep, agree strongly, agree strongly, all the way down. I don't want to spend my time on that. Let's move on. Right. So I just want to be clear. So the, the report you have is on online panels, but this example you're just sharing with us um, from donor research is to basically say, even if you're not using an online panel, when you're doing online surveys, we always have to be really careful about what we're asking our participants. You know, is it going to be too much cognitive effort? Is it just too daunting? Exactly. Does it look really bad on screen? Um, so even if you aren't using online panels, uh, this is a call to action about really making sure that you're checking uh, the, the quality, even if it is your very own list. Right. And what a lot of clients worry about with a more difficult or more time consuming question is that people will terminate at that point, which is not completed. What we're finding is yes, there are people who will terminate. There are also a lot of people who will just go, well, I, you know, I've invested eight or nine minutes of this already. I'll just skip this question. But unfortunately, skip this question means I got to put in answers of some kind. So I'll just put in a random answer, or I just won't read this lengthy paragraph, or I won't really look at this ad, and they'll just move right by. So what some of the things we learned in Still More Dirty Little Secrets of Online Panels applies even beyond using panels. Got it. Excellent. Thank you, Ron. And just one last question before we wrap up, um, and I do appreciate all your time today. Um, you know, I know you had, I think, four or five panels that were in your experiment, correct? Um, right. Is it, you know, there are obviously a lot of panels out there, um, and some of them are more rigorous than others. You know, there are the online panels that do a lot of recruiting. They do a lot of online recruiting and, you know, um, and have certain processes. And then, of course, there's some really high-end panels um, that have much more rigorous um, recruiting processes because they um, they want to be able to say that they've got a panel that really is truly representative of the U.S. population, perhaps, or whatever population is of, of interest. Um, so, you know, is there any data um, from your work or do you have any suggestions on, you know, Obviously, the really high-end panels cost a lot more, right? right? Your cost per complete is, is a lot more. I'm assuming that your experiment was with the more common types of online panels and not the super-duper high-end ones. Is that correct? Yeah, and again, we, we chose, just randomly chose five of the 10 largest online panels. So again, these are the ones that are getting the most business, doing the most surveys, have the most respondents, et cetera. Um, and there are, there are definitely differences from one panel to the next. 
Uh, and we have seen that in our work far beyond the, the Dirty Little Secrets series. Um, one of the things that we do is we keep a kind of a running tally when we, when we do blend and we'll look and say, okay, we tossed out 20% of panel A, 28% of panel B, and 63% of panel C. Panel C is no longer eligible for our surveys. And so if you, if you do that, but that really requires investment. That requires time investment and effort investment. The biggest problem that's happening in the research industry today when it comes to quantitative is the field is a black hole. Clients turn it over to panel vendors or they turn it over to research vendors and say, well, this, this well-known research vendor, I'm sure they must be doing their due diligence. They must be assuring that I'm getting good quality, so I'm not going to worry about it, right? Well, as, as some of the stats that I quoted you show, 90, 95% of them are not. Or they're doing some things, but they're not taking it the full. So they're getting rid of maybe the 10% worst, but those 30% that are still pretty doggone bad yeah. are in there and they're trashing your data, right? So if you, you've got two choices. You either have to do this yourself to make sure that it's done right, or if you use somebody, whether it's a panel provider, a panel aggregator, or a research company like Harmon Research or, or anybody else, don't take their word for it. Prove it. Yeah. Show me how many people you threw out. Show me why you threw them out. But at the same time, it's also not just the research vendor's responsibility. Because if you give the research vendor a questionnaire and it doesn't lend itself, you don't have those traps built in, you don't have the fake brands, you don't have the red herring questions, you don't have the programming instructions for um, if they straight line, just terminate them, et cetera. That's not the research vendor's responsibility. That's you as the program, the, the project manager, the questionnaire designer. So it, 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 you know, the, I hate to do this whole thing, but it takes a village. It really <laughs> does. Um, but it, you cannot turn it over to somebody else again, no matter who that is, and say, I'm sure they're gonna take care of it. Because, the, you know, you talk with anybody in the field and they'll say, no, they're not taking care of it. They're just not. Right. Ron, thank you so much for this very brutally candid look at online panels. Um, I know that, um, that your report has a lot more detail in it. Um, can people download that report from your website? Actually, they can go to the website, uh, click on that page, and request the report. Got so it. We, don't, we don't actually uh, give the full download, but or they just send me an email is the best way to get it. Okay, excellent, because I know that a bunch of our students are definitely going to want to see that report. And is that report right. something that you provide for free, or is there a fee for yes. that? Yep. Uh, you are providing for free. free. Yep. I mean, excellent. certainly, I hope this interests some, uh, some end users out there, and we get business out of it. <laughs> but if the only thing that happens is that we improve research for at least a few clients out there, then we've done our job. Excellent. Ron, thank you so much for your time today. I truly appreciate it. And um, for our students, I will be posting Ron's contact information um, with, this post, with this video. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Catherine.